vamos para a gente vir. And now, I will sing you a song.
Yes, he has for you.
And they want to know before they put their life out there on the line that they had a partner that they found. And they were, they were tight. And that's good in a lot of ways, and in some ways it could be not so good. Well, you know, I hear all of them. No man won't church, but the Lord I should make both of us. I didn't do anything. Yeah. <laughs> I ended up um, well here it was. Sometimes we'd have cookouts. Sometimes we'd have students get together and our guys are all as a group going down to the beach. And I caught myself doing what man will need to do instead of what God will need to do. And before long, I got out of church. I fell away from the Lord. And like the children of Israel, I wandered in a sin for the better part of 40 years. Just shot. And then in my late 50s, you know, it was almost 59, I think it was. We had some family problems. My brother, one of our brothers got real sick and he passed away. And he had asked my mother and I if he thought he could trust us to take care of his estate. And we ended up, we, um, my mother and I, we tried to fulfill his request. And we did it for a long time. About six months, my mother and I spent running the road taking care of everything that he had to take care of, including this funeral. And we ended up, the whole time we were doing this, a family that when we were not poor and had nothing, we wore clothes that people gave to us, we ate food that people brought to our house. My mother didn't want to have to ask the welfare department for anything. And we survived on what we were given. And finally, here we are 40 years later in the life, and we have more things than we've ever needed. I have more now in my life than I've ever had. But all of a sudden, here we were as a family. At least we had love back then for each other. And here we are 40 years later, and every one of us has got more things than we could ever ask for, but we have treated every bit of it. We have taken away from God here, we have taken away from God over there, and before long, we have just put God right out of our eyes. And we have all this material thing. And I, uh, my brother, I keep repenting from all that said I'm sorry sits because of the cost. Words sit over what he would or would not get. And there was nothing really bad. But he did get his share right down to the penny, I'm not sure. No problem. But because of what he did to my mother and I, it made me slow down and made me think. And I thought, here, a family that I've loved all my life, I could see it literally torn apart by greed and desire for the things of this world. And one day, August the 8th, this coming August, will be seven years completed, I made my way back to my bedroom for the first time and just shot. 40 years. And down on my knees. And I said, Lord, look, I've run a long, long time. I have completely ignored you and your word and what you want for us. But if you can find it in your heart to forgive me, I will live for you and I will do your will. Every day of the rest of my life. Thank you, Jesus. And that's what we did. My wife came home from work. Excuse me. She, uh, she 
She had never seen me today. She came off of work, walked in like she normally does, and I'm back in my bedroom, beside our bed on my knee, pulled my heart out to God. And I know she had to wonder what's wrong. But she set her stuff down and quietly she went back to the front of the house. When I finished, I went to get right with God. I went to the front of the house. And I told her the commitment that I just made to the Lord. And I said, I want to do this. And I said, will you join me? Her best, her and she said, yes, I will. So we gave our hearts to God. We started the ministry. And we've gone out and sang for the Lord for the last six years. So before I get too teary at it, I can't talk about the love of Jesus Christ. And what he's done for me without giving you much for me. He, Jesus Christ, is a wonderful God. He's a loving God. He's a great God. He has not failed me, not one time in the last almost seven years. Well, even before that, really, but ever since I gave my heart to Him and started living for Him, He's been right there beside me. I worry myself that everywhere I go, I can stand and I can tell you things all day long. But if it don't come from the heart, if it don't come from God's word, it should go out of there. I have dedicated my life to Jesus Christ. We're going to talk about a few minutes. I think my wife's teaching the same of the song. I don't have no idea what's in the movie. Go ahead and leave my just tears.
need to give back to, to the Lord that which is already given. Lord, thank you for the wonderful day. Thank you for it. Pastor Tim and his wife, with Patty. Lord, thank you for the word that they're going to bring to us. And thank you for the privilege and honor to give back to you that which is already yours. So you can use it in your will.
this morning, if you have your Bibles, if you'd like to, if you turn to Luke chapter 5, I believe it's going to be. We're going to start with verse 1, and I'll give you a second or so to get there. I really hope you enjoy our songs. Uh, hope they touch your heart some way or another. Um, one of the ladies asked me a while ago was I one of the pastors out of Carolina. <laughs> well, you know, I um, just became a pastor. As I just got my, my license. I've spoken very few places. Both of the speaking I've done has been, like I said earlier, when we go out and do ministries, I get to testify about Jesus Christ and what He's done in my life. And telling people of His love. So our Bible says, tells every one of us to go into the highways and byways and tell people of the love of Jesus Christ. Tell them of His wondrous works. Okay? That is called the Great Commission. And I was surprised when I started doing some research a year or so ago about how many people in today's church have never even heard the expression of the Great Commission. I would have you know that I, um, I hope you can tell that I love the Lord. I can't thank Him enough for what He's done in my life, the changes He's made. And I love to read his word, and I be honest with you about that. That's kind of a strange thing. I uh, I hate to read. I hate to read them with a passion. That was my one of my worst subjects in school. I wasn't good at it. I was good in math. I was good in gym and art and history, but English and reading. Uh, I, I, if I would have got in trouble, I'd probably skip class. But that day. That day that I told you about what I gave my heart to the Lord. After I left my bedroom and told my wife the commitment I made, I went and sat in my chair in the front room. And I continued to pray and I, I thought about the commitment that I just made to God. And I said, Lord, I said, while we're back on speaking terms, I said, I want you to uh, know, I said, you probably already do, I said, but I know I need to read this word. This word right here. God's holy word. I need to read it. I need to know it. Because if I don't know how what God wants, how can I please it? So I went back to my bedroom again and I took out that little teeny Bible that I was given, that was given to me as a gift when I was 16 years old. And I opened it up, and I said, oh my goodness. The words were so small, that was just a big blur. I couldn't even see it. And I said, that ain't going to work. So I went to the front room, and I got one of these great big, huge desk-type Bibles that we had years and years ago. And I picked it up and started reading that. It was like lugging a suitcase around. Which, I mean, it was really just a big Bible. And I told my wife, I said, this ain't going to work. I said, take me to the Bible bookstore. And we went and got some Bibles, and I came home and I opened up that Bible to the New Testament, which is where I want to start. It was the most closest thing to today. And I laid my hands on those pages, and I said, Lord, I need you to give me a desire to read your word. And Lord, I don't want just a desire. I ask God for a burning desire to read His Word. And I ask Him for a burning desire to pray. And that's the first two things I ask God for. And I'll be honest with you. If you don't want it, don't ask Him for it. <laughs> because He gave me a desire to read that all my friends and everybody around me says, do you ever put that thing down? And I, I don't put it down much. I have to be honest. But back in January this year, January 20th, I was sitting there that morning and I was finished my morning prayers and I was reading God's Word. And I've gotten to Luke chapter 5 at verse 1. Pick up a mic. You died. I died? Yeah. 
batteries. <laughs> Just get a regular mic, not that one. The mic, the one, the one you had. Regular mic? Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Check. All right, I'm sorry. I had no idea. I um, started reading. And if you want to go along with me, it says, uh, verse 1 says, And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Genesaret. Now, I guess you've got some, have some flashes going here. Now, you can read above me, each one of them, the Gospels mostly, has a, a different name for the Lake of Genesaret. But it's all the same area. And they, the names are, uh, let's see, this is Genesaret, also called the Sea of Galilee, and also the Sea of Tiberias. And you can see the scripture behind me if you want to write them down. And that first verse said he was there. And as he was talking, and speaking, he saw these two ships. Of course, most of you know this if you read God's word. And he said in verse 2, he said, I saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. Now when you look at that word gone, it's just something that kind of jumped off the page that morning. I had read this scripture time and time and time again. And just, but that morning, it just, I guess you probably had that. You just kind of leaped off the page and I thought, why is this so strong to me this morning? Well, when you get to doing some research on the scripture, it said they were gone. They had disembarked. That's another word for gone. You know, when I look at our churches today, if we take the word ship out and put it in church. I made a note here. It said today we have where the... How many churches today do we have where the fishermen have gone out of them? Okay. The men have washed their nets. They have rolled up their fishing rods, loaded up their fishing gear, and have given up and left. Now that's what I got out of the scripture. But we won't go on back a whole lot more. So I want you to know there are only maybe a few. Just a few of us. But look, you're not by yourself. Every church we go to is seen that. Every church we go to witness for the Lord. They all have the same problem. See, the devil is the same lie everywhere you go. He'll tell the same old lame lies. He'll make people feel like that there's no use of serving the Lord. That we ought to just give up and go home. Okay? But well, verse 3 said, and it said, He entered into the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and talked to people out of the ship. And here we are again. Let's look at a couple words in that verse. There's a word in this verse that needs to be examined. The word is prayed. In the Greek language, the word for prayed is erotea. Okay. Green, Indian, buddy, who might want to learn a little bit of the Greek. And, you know, these, the New Testament was. Uh, Change over from the Greek language. So, and in eroteo in Greek means to interrogate, to request, or to ask, beseech, to desire, to entreat, or pray. Jesus was desiring him okay, to do what he asked. Luke 5, 4 says, 
And when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. Anybody here know what the word draught means? You what kind of text? All right. I was the same way. Don't you worry about it. I was the same way. I just read all these scriptures and I thought, you know, let's dig in this morning on that January 20th day. A draw is a large, many, okay. not just one, but, but many. Well, you know, um, Jesus didn't ask Simon to launch. He told Simon to launch. Second, Jesus said, let down your net for a draw. And that word for draw in Greek is agora. Meaning a catching. Yeah, I, I would think there's some men in here, more than a lot of churches. And I think that there ought to be at least one or two fishermen in here or has fish in the ears. Well, there's some women too. Now, I've been fishing many times, and you know, it's kind of a little discouraging sometimes when you only catch one or two or none. But it's great when you catch a whole bunch. So, the other word definition for that is haul. And that's what I like. I like to catch a haul. And I really feel like that I want to go out and get a haul for Jesus Christ. All we can get. First, Luke 5, 5 says, And Simon answered and said unto him, Master, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. That's not like people you know. But he said, Simon was at least smart enough to understand that he was talking to the master. Somewhere in the depths of his soul, he knew that. But he said, nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. So let's compare the first five verses with the life of Christians today. Somehow most of us started out by giving our hearts to the Lord by some means or another, either through preaching, through teaching, through witnessing, or by some people singing like we did long ago, or by a friend or either a family member who told us about the sacrifice that Jesus Christ had made for us. And they told us about what Jesus had done in our life. I would like to think on the day that all of us gave our heart to the Lord and repented of our sins. I would hope to think that we were all extremely joyful, happy, and excited. I got all the hope that most of us couldn't wait to go tell someone about the gift of salvation that Jesus Christ had given to us. When I was working on that part, I thought back. When I was a small kid, I was given my first fishing rod. Just a small fishing rod. I believe it was a little old Shakespeare rod with a Shakespeare reel. But you know, I was proud to have it. I couldn't wait to tell someone about my new fishing rod. I got to tell them what kind of rod it was. I got to tell them what the action level was. And I got to tell them what it was a lightweight or medium weight or heavy duty rod. And whether it was a casting rod or surcasting rod, a boat rod, a fly rod, or either just a plain old cane pole with a string and a cord. See, there's all kinds of rods like there's all kinds of Christians. But they all do the same job. They all are used to catch fish. All I knew was I was glad I had that rod. And I couldn't wait to tell someone about it. And the very first opportunity, I took that old fishing rod fishing. 
Later in life, I was able to afford my first fishing boat. If you want to call it a fishing boat. It was a 15-foot Coleman canoe. Orange in color. Me and my friend Ricky, my lifelong friend. Boy, we thought that was the coolest thing. We took that fishing rod, put it in that canoe or tackle boxes, our lunch, our drinks, and off to the lake we went to go fishing. Sometimes we caught a lot of fish, and sometimes we didn't catch anything. I'll have to admit that when we didn't catch anything, I was a little discouraged. And the days we didn't catch anything uh, were kind of miserable. But we didn't give up. It never crossed my mind to quit. In fact, we went fishing every chance we had. Now, I'm going to be the first to tell you my wife has done this ministry for almost six years. Time after time after time after time. Sunday after Sunday after church, we packed up all of our singing equipment. We've gone everywhere that somebody will open the door. We have taken same care homes, sister living homes, old folks' homes, we've sang at churches. We've traveled Virginia, Carolina, and been as far as almost Tennessee. Many times, people sat and didn't do anything, they didn't show any emotion, didn't show any expression. They didn't raise their hands to God. They didn't pour out their heart to the Lord. They sat there. And many times we felt rejected. Many times we felt like giving up. We felt like we want to quit. But I promised God. I promised God that I wouldn't quit. I wouldn't give up no more. If He would stay with me, I would stay with Him. But then on the other, on the flip side of that, every so often we go to a place and we would see where. All of a sudden, you think you're not making any headway. And then you look out, they already start you singing, and all of a sudden, you see a, a brother or sister raise their hands to Jesus Christ. You see tears pour down somebody's cheeks. But the Holy Spirit was working on them, or either they were receiving a gift from the Holy Spirit, would be to build up spiritually. Every so often, see, God knows. God is, He's on top of things. He knows. He knows our hearts. He knows our desires. He knows everything that's about us. And He knows that sometimes we get tired and we want to give up. And just at the nick of time, it seems like all of a sudden, when we feel like we just can't do this anymore. We'll see somebody walk down the aisle. Mm -hmm. Come down to the altar. They'll pour their heart out to the Lord. They'll repent. Oh, hallelujah to God. Praise your Lord in heaven. Mm -hmm. To know from where I was seven years ago to where God has brought us to today. To know the changes he's made in us, the things he's done. And that now we're out doing his will. Trying to bring people to Christ. And to know that God has made us into a usable vessel. A usable vessel that we, through our testimony, can tell someone about Jesus Christ. I've heard a lot of excuses. I've heard people say, I've asked people. See, right now I told the lady a while ago that we had one that passed away in our group. We had one that's dying of cancer. And unless the Lord intervenes, he doesn't have much longer. 
So I've been shopping around trying to find somebody who loves the Lord enough to do His will. Who loves the Lord enough to go out to highways and byways with us. Be part of a ministry team. It takes dedication. It takes desire. It takes commitment. It takes want to. It takes the love of Jesus Christ. So the excuses I've got over the years is old pastor. I tried to witness, but nobody listens. I have invited people to church, but nobody comes. Oh, pastor, I have been part of a ministry team, but I quit because nobody ever converted. I'd like to help out, but I'm just too busy on my job. I would like to witness, but I'm not good with words. I'm just not an outgoing person. One person told me I hadn't done that. <laughs> but I quit because I was it was too time consuming. I made a note here to thank God for the few silences of today who will say, nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down my net. Yes, yes, yes. We went to a church down in Carolina. I guess it's probably been over a year now. Before the COVID set in. I told you sometimes we're people too. Sometimes we tire. Sometimes we feel like what's the use. And the Lord knew. He knew my promise. He knew my heart. He knows my love. We started singing. Witness the people. Tell people about the love of Jesus Christ. And not one, not two, but three. Three people. All at one time. One of, we, one of them, I should say, were two of them first, and then we found out a third one that was a lady that was bad that hadn't spent much time in church and really didn't know what to do, but she knew that God was dealing with her. So she sat at her seat and she poured her heart out to the Lord and gave her heart to God. We found out after church was over. But during the service, two people walked down the aisle. A man that had fallen away from God that came back. And his grandson, who had never known the Lord, came with him. They both picked up heart for the Lord together. He's talking about feeling like on top of the world. To know, I said, what God could do in our life that would help us, help other people in their life. Luke 5, 6 says, and when they had done what God wanted, and they had enclosed a great multitude of fishes, that their net was about to break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in other ships, that they would come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships, so that they began to sink. Ladies and gentlemen, we're at crossroads. We're at crossroads. And I know next Sunday you have a new pastor that's coming here to take over as your shepherd. I'll take you out. I took the liberty. I, I never did it before and I didn't know anything about the church, really where it was at. But remember, I've been out suffering for 30 years. So I asked my wife, she likes to get on the internet and do some research, and I asked her to pull up this church. And I looked at the church and I thought, man, that's a pretty church. Really. He had pictures on the internet of the outside. And I thought, man, that's, I know where Stroke, but I was raised around here. And I said, I know it was 
There's a lot of people here. I said, what a beautiful church. And this morning, I met a gentleman that was back there that apparently had part of the building of the church. But you know, I looked at the pictures on the inside. There again, it was even beautiful inside here. And I thought a lot of sacrifice that these people have made over these years. See, a lot of people before us gave, they sweated, they bled, they built, they built this church. A lot of them have passed away, some of them have passed back into sin. Well, I don't, we don't have any idea. But I'm willing to bet there were some good people here who love the Lord, who gave their heart to the Lord and built this church. And they left it to you to be the caretaker of. And I'm just going to be honest with you, one person to another. They haven't trusted people today to go on with God's ministry. To spread the gospel. I feel like in my heart, there's a hungry world out there. A lot of people that need God. A lot of people are, are lost, completely lost. You see the TV, you see, you hear the news, you see what's going on today. A lot of people just don't just don't have nowhere to turn. It's up to, up to us to go find them. What better gift can you give God and your pastor that's going to start next week? See, I'm going to tell you right now, I already know he's only a man. Just like me, just like everybody here. No pastor can do it all. None. None of them. Okay. All right? Jesus Christ was perfect. He left the splendor of heaven, came to earth, born into the flesh, did what his father said do, taught what his father said teach. And the word rejected him. They hung him on a cross. Until he died. But he didn't give up. He didn't quit. He did his ministry, and it's time that we do ours. I labeled this sermon Fisher of Men. That is part of it, if not all, of the Great Commission. This is our church, or your church. I'm just here today to speak. We need to make a decision. I'm going to close this kind of going on a little bit now, but I want to tell you. I made some notes here. So God wants to know where we stand. He wants to know what is our decision. Are we going to live for Him? Are we going to do what He asks us to do? Are we going to dedicate our lives to Him? Or are we just going to sit and watch our church die around us? There's a lot of churches that are dying. A lot of them are already shut the doors. Okay. What do we want as children of God? <coughs> that concludes the end of my sermon. I noticed one thing when I walked in this morning. I'm glad to see you. you still have an offering down here on both sides. Yes. Amen. Yes. yes. So many churches don't even have an offering to take them out. I can't tell you what to do. I can't tell you how to do. I can only suggest. If not here, at your seats, or at home, that you do some serious soul searching between now and next week. You find out where you stand with God. What you want out of life. What you expect from God and what you expect God to do for you. You have to know it's a partnership. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. And next week when your pastor gets here, 
I don't know. I don't know who he is. I don't know, I don't know his name. I don't know if he's got wife and children, whatever. But she welcomed him with open arms. Amen. Yes. And together as a team, every one of us go out and find someone to bring to church. They might laugh. They might mock. They might do whatever. You might be surprised what God will do in their life and what God will do in this church. Will you buy your gifts, please? Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we praise your holy name. We praise your Father for all the things that you do in the lives of each and every one of us. We thank you, Lord, for the changes that you have made in all of us. We ask you, Lord, to help us not to ever let our candle burn out. Not to ever let our wit die. We no longer be used to you. We ask you, Lord, to bless this church, bless these people. We ask you, Lord, to be with us in everything we do, everywhere we go, and every testimony we give. We ask you, Lord, to allow this church to prosper, prosper for you, that you may be exalted, and you may be lifted up, and you may be Put on the highest pedestal, Father, because it's all about you in the first place. We love you, we praise you, we thank you, and you're very blessing. We ask you now, Lord, as each person leaves here, that you go with them and guard them and protect them. Watch over the way you always have. We love you, we praise you, we thank you. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.